Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's lunch hour lecture. I'm Jack Ashby from UCL Public and Cultural Engagement. I'm here to host you and to welcome today's lecturer, who is Dr. Tim Beasley-Murray from the UCL Global Citizenship Program and the, uh, the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies here at UCL, where he is senior lecturer in European thought and culture. Tim's research operates on the intersection of literature, philosophy and political theory, and he's going to be talking to us today on, on, on one of his areas of work in global citizenship. If you could join me in welcoming Dr. Tim Beasley-Murray. Great. Um, thank you very much all for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Jack, uh, for your introduction and to lunch our lectures team, and also the technical uh, people as well. Um, yes, today I've, I've got the longest title uh, possible, The Paradoxical Concept of Global Citizenship and the Challenge of Global Fellow Feeling from a Polis to Today. I don't think I've ever given a talk with such a long uh, title. It's not quite my research because I have two roles. One is, one is my normal work in, in, in CIS and in, in European thought and culture, and the other is being in charge of the Global Citizenship here at, here at UCL and the Global Citizenship Program. So I'll talk about that right at the end. What I want to do to look at this long title is to break it down. I want to talk about global citizenship by first of all talking about the global, then about the concept of citizenship, then how they link together in this curious concept of global citizenship, the tensions within which I want to explore, and then address the question of fellow feeling, a rather odd term, but I think is crucial, and finally end up with education and our program. But to talk about the global, I want to take us to somewhere slightly different. I want to talk about two students, but not two students here at UCL, nor two real students, but two fictional students. Two fictional students in the novel by Balzac, Le Père Goriot, Rastignac and Bianchon. They're ambitious students in Paris in the 1830s um, who are trying to get their, make their way in the world. One wants to be a poet, the other is a medical student. They're penniless, and they have this encounter just outside the Jardin du Luxembourg, and here is the exchange that they have. Rastignac. Do you recall the passage where Rousseau asked the reader what he'd do if he could make himself rich by killing an old Mandarin in China merely by willing it without budging from Paris? Yes. Well, Bianchon, I'm well onto my 33rd Mandarin. Rastignac, don't make a joke of it. Really, if it were proved to you that the thing were possible and the nod, that a nod of your head would be enough, would you do it? Okay. So Rastignac poses this ethical question. Would we wish someone dead in China, someone that we wouldn't know, and thereby get riches, have our ambitions fulfilled? And this question that incidentally doesn't come from Rousseau at all, there's no passage in Rousseau that this corresponds to, um, uh, contains a number of, of, of serious uh, subsidiary questions. What are we willing to do to guarantee our own success? Uh, who are we willing to step on or allow to suffer or to die in this case for our own gain? To whom do we have moral obligations and responsibilities? And uh, in, in, in a larger context, are these responsibles fewer if they're not people whom we know, if they're not our immediate neighbor, but rather people living on the other side of the globe? The question here is, what are our global responsibilities? Well, obviously, in Balzac's novels or in the setting of, of Paris, 1835, there's a particular context, okay? Paris is far away. It would take weeks, uh, sorry, China is far away. It would take weeks to get to China. Any news would be filtered through, traveler's accounts and so on. China, or the world more generally, we can see China here simply standing for the exotic and the distant and the unimaginable, is something far away, something that's little known. And the Mandarin features here as some abstract and, and, and un, unimaginable figure. And here we have, incidentally, a Western cliche of the unimaginability of China. This is a big world, the world of, uh, of the 1830s, a world that will only get smaller with processes of globalization, but still is a large world. And in this context, it's rather easy to wish the Mandarin dead. London 2015, of course, is something rather different. We know that we are connected to the world, to China, yeah, let's, let's say, but the world more generally, in very real and immediate ways, specific ways, through media, through the internet, through the products that we buy, that, which may be made in China, uh, through the people next to us, through processes of travel, through immigration, and so on. And the result is a much, much smaller world where Rastignac's question takes on a different hue. 
We cannot simply and unproblematically wish the man to be dead and, and say that we wouldn't know about it, as it were. So what I'm describing is perhaps a, a familiar uh, picture, uh, because we're all implicated in it, uh, one of global interconnectedness. We live in a world where our choices and our actions, all of them in some way, uh, uh, have, have an impact, our, our economic, our environmental, our political, our social choices. As Lenin said, yeah, everything is connected. And our choices have a, a, an impact on the billions of human beings with whom we share this, this, this planet. One, one, one thinker has talked about overlapping communities of fate, which I think is quite an evocative phrase. There is an inescapability about our responsibilities. We have to recognize them in some way. And as a result, if we belong to overlapping communities of fate, then we already belong to some sort of uh, global community uh, with, to which we have certain responsibilities. And I believe there's some sort of imperative because of the factual situation in which we find ourselves, at least to think about ideas of citizenship that might correspond to that belonging to uh, uh, a global community. Okay, well, so much... Um, for the global, now I think we can turn to the idea of citizenship. And to think about citizenship, I don't want to go back to Paris of the 1830s, but much, much further back, right, to Greece uh, between the 8th and the 5th century before the Common Era and the developments that are happening there. And this is somewhat of an idealized picture, a, a, a little story I'm going to tell, one that is largely filtered through Hannah Arendt, a political thinker I do work on quite a lot. But what we see in this period is groups of people, communities, rejecting previous forms of social organization. They're rejecting pre-political forms of primitive kingship and so on, and coming together in cities, creating the polis. And the key feature, uh, I would argue, of the polis is in the polis one does things through speech, through persuasion through argument and through the power of words, instead of hitting people over the head. So speech replaces violence. Speech is talking about things as opposed to violence that is forcing people to do things. Arendt here. To be political, to live in a polis, meant that everything was decided through words and persuasion and not through force and violence. I just highlight this in the current context. Incidentally, we're having a public uh, uh, event uh, next week to discuss the, 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 the ramifications of the violence in Paris recently. But this suggests that speech is the fundamental presupposition of citizenship, and that the right to freedom of speech that is not met by violence is not simply one of many rights that constitutes citizenship, but is the fundamental right of citizenship. And maybe this is one perspective for thinking about the Charlie Hebdo. Uh, uh, and the violence that, that, that met that. But that's not the only uh, uh, characteristic and move that was uh, involved in the creation of the polis. Um, in the creation of the polis, people went from pre-political life to the polis, from the natural world. They went to the artificial world of civilization by throwing up walls. They separated themselves off from the natural world. They left the sphere of necessity and enter the sphere of freedom. They rejected bonds of kinship, which are forced on you by nature. And they, ch they chose bonds. They adopted forms of, of, of uh, uh, bonds that had been chosen. Charisma of kingship was replaced by legitimate authority. Hierarchy was replaced by equality. The arbitrariness of some primitive leader's decision was uh, replaced by lawfulness. Violence, as I've said, was replaced by speech and persuasion. Tyranny was replaced by isonomia, equality before the law. That's what that means. And men and women living as beasts was replaced by men and women living as men and women. This is obviously Aristotle's definition that man is by nature a, a political animal and only gods and beasts live outside the polis. So what is citizenship then? Citizenship is coming together freely as equals to work for the common good within a framework of law that we have made and chosen to submit to, where all share the benefits and burdens of common existence. I think that's a reasonable working definition. It's against this background of Greek citizenship that we have to understand, uh, or, or, or we're, we're drawn to think about what global citizenship might be. Global citizenship. 
Well, who was the first global citizen? It was a man called Diogenes. Diogenes of Sinope, or Diogenes the Cynic, who was an extraordinary character. As you may know, lots of stories are told about him, how he lived in a barrel, how he masturbated in public, uh, and all sorts of things. He was someone who deliberately uh, went against the conventions of his time, eventually living in Athens, there are his dates. And at one point, uh, the story goes that he was asked, where are you from, O Diogenes? Right? And his answer to this was, I'm a citizen of the whole world. And we see the Greek there. I'm not going to attempt to butcher it, but I'm a cosmopolitan. And of course, global citizenship isn't a new term. It has a, an ancient lineage in the notion of cosmopolitanism. I'm a citizen of the world. What he was doing was little less shocking than masturbating in public. What he was doing was he was saying that he did not identify primarily with his particular city or the polis, but rather with humanity as a whole, a concept that scarcely existed. People did not think of themselves as part of humanity, but rather primarily as members of their particular city. He was suggesting that we ought to try and treat the members of the whole of humanity with the same sort of responsibility and respect for rights that we treat our immediate fellow citizens. Global citizenship, or cosmopolitanism, was taking the idea of citizenship beyond the borders of the particular city and was a radical, in fact, paradoxical idea. Absolutely paradoxical. His listeners would have thought he was completely mad. And this idea does not lose in its paradox. Here's, here's one uh, contemporary writer who comments on this. The idea of citizenship gets its moral force from the experience of people living together in cities, people who identify with one another, uh, face common enemies, and so forth. The idea of global citizenship takes this idea and stretches it so as to embrace the whole of humanity, regardless of what relationships may exist between people across the globe. It assumes that the moral force of citizenship can survive stretching, but this, to say the least, is something that needs to be argued for. And it's quite a telling quotation. Where we are today is, following on what I was saying about globalization, we, we have to think in terms of global citizenship because of this dense enmeshment of human beings. But on the other hand, we have to ask ourselves, what happens to this core notion of citizenship uh, in that stretching that occurs as it's transposed out onto a global scale? And what I'd argue is that the notion of citizenship gets inverted and becomes problematized, is turned inside out. And a range of paradoxes emerge that I think uh, we have to consider. So what are some of these paradoxes? Well, that's perhaps too strong a word, but, but, but it'll, it gets at some of the sense of it. Well, traditional citizenship, Greek citizenship, deals with the state. It deals with the city. Global citizenship is, as I said before, a weak oxymoron, a global city, as it were. It's a concept of citizenship without, as yet, we, we can't look into the future too far, any state that corresponds to it. Now, of course, there are theories of global citizenship that say that a, a world state would be a good thing and seek mechanisms, global mechanisms, of imposing obligations and duties on all the world's inhabitants as citizens. These are strong theories of global governance. But I'd argue that to do that, to, to make that shift and suggest that's what global citizenship is about, is missing a point. Global citizenship, in, in my view, or a more critical notion of global citizenship, is really a post-status position. It's skeptical of the whole idea of boundedness and bound boundaries by which traditional notions of the state are characterized. And after all, would we really want a global state? Uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, who I say is one of my big heroes, when she was asked what she thought about a global state, she said, oh yes, it's fine, as long as there was somewhere to hide from the global police force. Um, and, and that's sort of a joke, but given her experience of the horrors of what states do in the 20th century, she's got a very, very serious point. Okay, um, the second uh, paradox, if you want, is one of exclusivity and inclusivity. Traditional, or Greek citizenship, is an exclusive concept. And it's exclusive in two directions. First of all, externally. 
insofar as you were a citizen of Athens, you defined yourself as not being a citizen of Sparta. And any citizen of Sparta, you owed to him no, none of the duties that you owed to one of your own. It was exclusive. It excluded other cities. And of course, crucially, it, it excluded barbarians, who for the civilized, civilized Greeks were, were, were like the beasts in the Aristotle quotation I alluded to. It was exclusive, absolutely. You identified with your city for which you were willing to go and die. It was also, though, exclusive internally. As we know, uh, uh, for all the greatness of Athens, the promise of citizenship, the, the benefits of citizenship, were extended to very few, a very small number of adult males. Social inferiors, women, slaves, resident foreigners, those without any property and hence no stake in society, all of those were excluded. Traditional citizenship, or well, Greek citizenship, uh, uh, gained its vital force from through mechanisms of exclusion. Global citizenship, by contrast, is an inclusive uh, concept. And I would take this global in, in, in two ways as having two meanings. First of all, externally, or perhaps horizontally, we could say. It extends the notion of citizenship beyond the borders of particular cities, particular states, particular nation states, let's say. So in an, inter, an international and transnational sense, it's global. But second, and I don't think we should lose sight of this, it's also global and inclusive in, a, in perhaps what we could describe as, as a vertical uh, dimension. It wishes to extend the rights of citizenship to all, regardless of, of, of factors like gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, all class. It's about overcoming barriers of exclusion. But in, in this, of course, there is a tension. Um, the, second, uh, the third point, rather, relates absolutely to, 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 to the last one. Traditional citizenship deals with communities, constructs uh, communities that are homogenous, that agree on things, that, that are not characterized by difference in, in terms of religion, ethnicity, in terms of cultural and moral values. They agree. And it's possible to have something like uh, Pericles' funeral oration uh, uh, in Thucydides that says, these are the values and we all adhere to them. A sense of, of identity, of cohesion, and a lack of heterogeneity, a, a homogenous citizen body. Global citizenship, by definition, deals with a notion of community, at least a notion of community, that is heterogeneous, that is by marked out by all the difference that we, there is in this world, religious uh, in terms of ethnicity, cultural and moral values. What this means is there is no equivalent to the funeral oration that says what Athenian values are. Rather, for, in, for, for global citizenship, what is in common is continuously fragile, is continually in question, continually needs to be renegotiated. Follows from this a demand, the notion of global citizenship demands of its heterogeneous citizens that they're able to disagree, agree and disagree, to find common ground across difference. And the final point uh, uh, is, in a sense, a restatement um, of uh, uh, an earlier point I have made. But on the one hand, um, this enmeshness, these overlapping communities of faith that I've, I've, I've talked about before, means that actually we already are global citizens, whether we like it or not. It is this inescapable reality. On the other hand, due to the, because of the paradoxes that I've described, global citizenship isn't really real. It, it, it doesn't quite make sense. It remains a challenge, an ambition, perhaps a metaphor, a potential attitude, a mode of engaging or of thinking, a demand yet to be fulfilled, or a promise. It has this unreal utopian uh, uh, existence that nevertheless uh, has a, an effect on, on perhaps the way we think or we ought to think. And here we come to the problem of fellow feeling. Global citizenship, cosmopolitanism, to use a, uh, uh, its um, older title, is something that people have been pretty dismissive of, right, and skeptical towards uh, 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 in the past and, and, and certainly in the present as well. Why? Well, it is absolutely the rejection of homogeneity, the rejection of exclusion that makes cosmopolitanism, 
cosmopolitanism suspicious. It's rootless. It's abstract. It's generalized. Look at the quotation here from Rousseau, from Emile. The essential thing is to be good to the people with whom one lives. Distrust those cosmopolitans who go to great length to discover duties they do not deign to fulfill around them. A philosopher loves the Tatars so as to be spared having to love his neighbor. Okay, so we've got Rousseau's wonderful sort of rhetorical dismissal of cosmopolitanism. Behind it is the idea that really it's only with people like you that you can ad identify with, who, with whom you can share this common feeling. And cosmopolitanism is all about the abstract. Oh, yes, that's my global citizen. But it's not enough. There isn't enough motive power to make people act. Um, there is this skepticism, I say, that a notion of global citizenship, shorn of attachment to the particular, has the motive force to bring people to feel passionately and hence to act on their responsibilities. Well, the quotation at the bottom from, from a contemporary writer um, puts it quite nicely. Um, Cosmopolitanism, as an ethical commitment, strains to extend our concrete, concrete realities to include some distant and generalized others who, we are told, are our global neighbors. The idea might give you the warm and fuzzies, but it's nothing for which you'd be willing to go to war. Very interesting notion. We think of Karl Schmitt, by the way, the German political thinker, who defined the politics as, as a, the political identity as being the willingness to go to war. The suggestion here is that cosmopolitanism produces this, this, this lukewarm feeling of solidarity with the suffering of others, whether it's you know, the Mandarin in China or people who are suffering throughout the world today. But it doesn't give us that driving passion, that sense of commitment, which would allow us to go to extremes, really to do something. Uh, and, and here he uses the extreme case of, of, of being willing to go to war. And I want to think for a moment about what the role here of feeling of passion in politics. Now, Axel, from the, who's here from the Center for Transnational History, and uh, Ute Steiger from the European Institute, and Dina Gusenov as well, we have a research project that is looking at the role of passions in politics, this, this, this difficult relationship. Often the passions are thought to be something that shouldn't be in politics, right? Because they disturb the cool functioning of reasoning, and passions are the irrational that can cause violent disturbance. But I think we need to have a more nuanced view of the role of passions in politics. Passions are the things that make us do things. The connection between emotion and motion right, is, is one we might want to think about. And fellow feeling, arguably, this sense of our feeling together is indispensable for political communities to work. Rousseau, for example, at the end of the social contract, talks about the sentiments of sociability without which it is... Uh, impossible uh, to be a good citizen. The question for global citizenship is a very serious one. Is it possible to generate effective and cohesive fellow feeling that transcends cultural difference, moral difference, religious difference, and so on? It's a really, really serious problem. You know, uh, 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 the Voltaire quotation, you know, I may disagree with you, but I'm willing to go to be put to death for your right to, to say what you believe, or I forget exactly how it goes. Is that really the case? Are we, are we committed? Can we commit ourselves emotionally to an acceptance of, of difference? And even if that were possible, if it were possible for us to have a notion of global citizenship that would be effectively cohesive, how would we propagate it? Right? How would we encourage it? Encourage people to think that more in terms of, less in terms of their particular communities, but more in terms of their belonging to a global community. Well, let's look at some of the traditional answers to how one fosters a fellow feeling. Um, Rousseau, at the end of uh, the social contract, talks about civil religion. And what really he means are rituals and national ceremonies and so on. And these are the ways in which people are encouraged or taught to love their duties. Okay, well, civil religion. Could there be a civil religion of global citizenship? Um, art. Yeah? Perhaps it's this, uh, in the symbolic level, in the aesthetic sphere, that we learn to come together. And most recently, Martha Nussbaum, um, in her book on, on, on political emotions, the subtitle is Why Love Matters for Justice, she suggests that this might be possible. Well, civil religion, art. 
it's very difficult to imagine what a globally cohesive civil religion might look like, or indeed what a globally cohesive art that would, would, would play this role would look like. On the one hand, there's a the danger that it would be too specific. It would apparently be global, but in fact it would be European, and most probably French at base. And as a result, it would fail to account for the cultural variety of the world. Or, on the other hand, it would be banal, it would be too vague, it would be too, too abstract, and wouldn't really have that, that emotive traction that civil religion or a unifying art are meant to have. And one just needs to compare here what, what, what Jacques Delors says about the European Union, right? The problems just within Europe of getting a transnational sense of, of Europe. He says, you know, Europeans will not fall in love with a single market. It's actually a very astute point that the, the, the dry, bureaucratic nature of our transnational Europe here in, 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 sorry, transnational union in Europe fails to gain this uh, emotive traction, fails to establish some sense of uh, common feeling. No, if civil religion, um, if art are unlikely uh, to be the solution, then of course the, the, the third possible way, which is also thought of by Rousseau and others, would be education. And education has the uh, advantage that it can incorporate dif difference. It can be critical. And surely then some sort of education for global citizenship is going to be the route to generating this common, this fellow feeling which will be necessary for an age in which global citizenship is inevitable. What will an education for global citizenship look like? Well, it will encourage students to think in terms of what they share in common and how they're already implicated in the global. It will encourage them to think in terms of differences, those differences of culture, values, power, perspective, that cut across the common world. And it hopefully it will teach them how or help them learn how to negotiate those differences with respect, but not indifference. Incidentally, when we treat difference with indifference, we erase it. Yeah? Indifference is a very dangerous phenomenon in education as anywhere else. Um, it will encourage the sort of participation that emerges from reflection on that global enmeshness um, and will help to define a sense of rights and responsibilities on which participation will be based. In sum, Though sort of we don't say this because this is a sort of the most important goal but one that's periphery, one that isn't directly aimed at by education for global citizenship. It will attempt to develop, to foster, to imagine what that fragile and difficult thing might be so necessary for cohesion and for action, namely global fellow feeling. And here's the uh, propaganda part. This, of course, is what we're trying to do. And Josh very kindly put our, our banner up here. But our Global Citizenship Program, which is one of the aims of UCL and one of the ways in which uh, UCL wants to make its education distinctive, tries to do something of this, right? And I quote from what we have on our website. Um, the UCL believes the education we provide must educate our students, not just as experts in their disparate fields, but as students who are global citizens, students who look beyond their individual and local interests, see the complexity of an interconnected world in its diversity and inequality, understand the nature of the challenges that face that world, are aware of their social, ethical, and political responsibilities towards it, are ready to display leadership and work together to change the world for the better. Okay, some high-minded stuff, but I think it's rooted in critical reflection, and it's what in our Global Citizenship Summer Program at the moment is the main uh, vehicle by which we try and make that uh, a reality. Okay, well, I'm doing quite um, well for time, actually. Um, well, let's return to the beginning, to Rastignac and Bianchon. What does Bianchon answer to the question? Well, he says, damn it. I've come to the conclusion that the Chinaman must live. Right? He's annoyed. He's annoyed that some sort of moral sense has kicked in, and hell, he can't wish the Mandarin dead. Now, our very modest ambition right, is to educate students who, without perhaps Bianchon's annoyance and reluctance, come to the same conclusion. Right? Students who allow the Mandarin to live. More seriously, an underlying and, and much greater ambition is that we're trying to educate students who, in the future, are able to make something of the promise of global citizenship real.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim, for such an engaging, fantastic talk. We do have time for questions. Um, if you do have a question, if you wouldn't mind just waiting for a microphone to come to you so people listening online can hear you too. Um, it, it seems to me that you're implying that differences must be accepted uncritically. And to me, this implies cultural relativism. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a massive question, isn't it? I, don't th I think there's a difference between um, accepting or, or, or trying to understand difference and, and, and somehow erasing it. Relativism says, well, anyth anything goes, we're not going to take a stand. And I think that was what I was trying to, the point I was trying to make um, about uh, 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 negotiating difference with understanding, but not with indifference, not being indifferent to those. Clearly, there are cultural practices that, that, that we think are wrong, ways of organizing things socially that we think are wrong. But I think it's important to, to understand without, without being indifferent to, to, to that difference. That's a much, much bigger question. The great book on that is um, Kwame Appiah's book on cosmopolitanism that addresses all those questions absolutely head on. And it's a very accessible uh, book designed for, for a very much a general reader. Um, but yes, it's a problem. But that's the problem, th the sort of question that we want to raise. Yeah. There's a question at the top and then one down on the side. A question that sort of meanders uh, from the last comment. Um, there was another Athenian coot, uh, Socrates, who in the Crito, um, before he's about to make his jailbreak, is confronted by, in his own mind, the laws. Mm -hmm. And it's a reciprocation. He has a contract with the state, which he can't renege on. And this is why he stays and accepts his hemlock. So the question is, if, for instance, a laws were not Athenian, but, for instance, British laws who came to Socrates. Why would he feel like he needed to abide by his contract with them? He doesn't have one. Um, okay, so that's a question about um, the binding force, right, of, of particular laws within a particular community and how that relates to it. I didn't, didn't ent entirely follow. But it's the fundamental issue of the social contract. The citizen has a social yeah. contract yeah. and the laws represent well, we are here to protect you, and in re return, you will obey what we say. And that's the fundamental yeah. for... I mean, I guess global citizenship does pose questions to notions of particular communities and, and national laws, and it, it seeks to relativize those by, by thinking that they're larger perspectives. I, I'm not sure I can answer your question any better than that. <laughs> Sorry, we can talk maybe afterwards. The lady in the hat down here has the question. Um, do you think you said that, like, the concept of global citizenship is abstract? And, mm. and I, I do agree with that. But maybe that's because it sort of evades the kind of material things in life, you know, uh, particularly, say, resources. Say, so people. Uh, want to belong to a nation state because that has resources, you know, to, to, to give them their benefits, their education, their rights, and so on, and, and so forth. So, uh, and, uh, so they pay their taxes for that. It's a kind of exchange. I mean, no one wants to be a stateless, you know, uh, because there's no global um, government to, to bestow those things. And so it <laughs> everyone actually wants the benefits to pay their taxes and be a, a citizen of a nation state, which is what we have at the moment, because that enables us to, to have you know, the, the, the benefits and the rights, of course. I, I guess what you're getting at is the question of rights and responsibilities and what mechanisms there are to enforce them. So within a, a nation state, let's say, we have various rights and we have responsibilities. Um, responsibilities, I don't know, to provide for the state itself that, 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 and, and the way in which we, 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 we enact those responsibilities, let's say, through paying taxes. 
right? And there are mechanisms, namely the Inland Revenue Service, that comes and forces you to, to, to do your bit, to, to, to fulfill your responsibilities. The problem with global citizenship is that we have rights and responsibilities in theory, right? And those responsibilities extend to inequality, right? And questions of poverty, but there are no mechanisms, no global mechanisms to enforce them. And this, there are well, a few. Right? There are, of course, mechanisms of global governments to enforce states to behave in certain ways, but they don't, you know, historically they don't work terribly well. And this, of course, is one of the weakness, weaknesses of a notion of global citizenship that is not paired up with a global state. So these are whole, whole sort of questions in the field of global governance. But you absolutely, uh, 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 you know, hit on, 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 on perhaps the Achilles heel of, 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 of notions of global citizenship. Yeah. There's a question in the center. <clears throat> Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation very much. Very thought-provoking. Just as a follow-up, how would you link what you're saying and this last question to efforts in the United Nations? It's interesting you didn't actually mention Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yes. Do you see this as a step in the right direction? or How do you see it as related to what you're saying, I guess? Um, as I say, that, you know, if you look at theories of global citizenship that exist at the moment, they can be they're different tendencies within them. There's certainly a strong notion of global citizenship. There's the idea there should be certain standards, certain rights that are universally valid and that ought to be imposed on, 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 on all, all, all the states in the world. And the, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and, and, and various institutions of global governance, that's what that's about. I think there's a slightly more, there's another version of global citizenship that's normally talked about as cl critical global citizenship that doesn't like the homogenizing aspect of that first strand. And there's a, there's a real tension uh, uh, between those two understandings. I actually think that the more difficult, critical uh, model of global citizenship that, that I was outlining actually has, has more, more productive potential. And, 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 and avoids this sort of false universalism of, you know, sort of Western-inspired uh, declarations of human rights that can be actually, you know, can, it, there could be a false, uh, falsely global aspect to it. In fact, it's, it, it, it's, there's this strong, strong notion, it, it doesn't reflect global diversity. But once again, that's a big debate within thinking about global citizenship. Yeah. Thanks. Does the whole idea of global citizenship depend upon a common language? Uh, that's quite interesting. I mean, John Stuart Mill has this famous quotation which says, in, a, in a, a nation with many languages, it will be impossible to generate fellow feeling, right? And so he's totally against Welsh and, you know, Gaelic and Breton, and, you know, he's thinking a Western European context. Um, no, on the contrary, I think we, we benefit from, and I think, you know, the, the cultural diversity, including li linguistic diversity, is what makes global citizenship difficult but necessary. And obviously, coming from CIS, where we teach many of these minor languages, I'd be the last to say that we should be Esperantists or, or hope for the global domination of English or anything like that. Um, no, but it does pose a challenge. Uh, linguistic diversity is, is exactly one of those, those, those aspects that makes our sense of belonging more difficult. Yeah. Have we got time for one last, one last very quick question? That's okay. Um, yes, I, I would just like to take you up on human rights um, as sometimes portrayed as Western values, mm. because uh, across the world, uh, states and uh, freedom movements are using human rights yeah. um, in their, their political struggles. And I, I think, um, I mean, we think of South Africa, the, the, yeah. the anti-apartheid struggle was, was based on that. Just in, in terms of um, fellow feeling, um, there are non-state institutions like NGOs that are perhaps the places where people put their emotional value in. Oxfam, Amnesty, and, and so on, global campaigns um, where people can invest uh, in, in that fellow feeling way. Just a minute. 
Right, and that would be the idea of sort of civil society as some, a global civil society that would be an alternative to, to, to a mechanism of global governance that might be the sort of sphere where, where this sort of fellow feeling that I think is necessary for, for, for ideas to be turned into action, right, where, where that fellow feeling could be generated. Absolutely, Julie. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Tim Beasley-Murray, for such a thought-provoking talk. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.